Welcome to the 60th episode of Tokyo Alumni Podcast. Today, our guest was originally a student at Aoba International School. She entered the school as an ESL student. Uh, despite that fact, she graduated there as a valedictorian of their middle school class of 1999. After AJIS, she attended Quaker High School in Pennsylvania, then went on to study at the,、uh, Washington University in St. Louis. After graduating, Washington University of St. Louis. She went on to enter a PhD program in political science at Stanford University and left with a master's degree,、uh, but left the PhD program early.、Um, after Stanford, she worked for an Asian VC in Silicon Valley, then moved back to Japan, where she started a career in MA advisory. She worked at various firms, including Credit Suisse, Deloitte, before going freelance doing translation and analyst work for financial institutions, consulting firms, and funds. Her now husband, Got seconded to his firm in the Mumbai office. So she went to India during that time. And that's when she met with、uh, yoga. It was during that time where she met yoga when she was on vacation at Sri Lanka, which we'll talk about later and how it relates a bit to her lifestyle, which includes things like her diet as well as her consumption and mindset in regards to sustainable living. She started a YouTube channel in 2018 where she shares vegan cooking recipes, mindfulness, and sustainable living ideas.、Uh, recently, she's moved to Nagano in the mountains and she, and she hosts various cooking and yoga themed offline and online events. She recently released her vegan cookbook, Ochi de Vegan, Jiokakan de Tabisur Sekai Shunaji, which has already earned a bestseller label on Amazon for being number one seller in the specialized cooking category. Welcome to the podcast, Natsuki. Thank you for having me today. Hi, I'm Natsuki. <laughs> Hi, and、um, you know, congratulations on the book.、Um, I think you have a hard copy with you. Can you tell us a bit about this? Sure. Ochi de Pigan? Sure.、Uh, so it's my first cookbook ever. And so, as,、um, as you said, I started my YouTube channel in 2018. I don't have any you know, cooking, like chef experience or background or anything like that. I just started posting、um, cooking videos, and now I have 83,000 subscribers to my channel. Yeah, and <laughs> I just published my new cookbook, so I'm very excited. And、um, it's a vegan cookbook, so it doesn't use any、um, animal based. Food, but I introduce recipes from 14 different countries and regions. And、um, it's only in Japanese at this point. But if you have any vegan Japanese friends,、uh, maybe you can recommend this book to them. That's really cool.、Uh, we were just talking offline how definitely, you know, being vegan, being a vegetarian seems to be something on the rise. My youngest brother's、mm-hmm. a vegan. And、um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a really cool thing. And we'll talk about your channel a bit later too, because there's kind of these multiple sort of facets that you're、mm-hmm. involved in that all seem to sort of overlap in regards to sort of this healthy living, whether it's yoga、sure. or, you know, sort of consumption patterns, skincare, and whatnot.、Uh, but let's talk a little bit about Natsuki the person first. So、um, mm-hmm. you have this very unique background where you, Entered Alba International School. So you're the second guest we've had、uh, with the Alba background、uh, with very little English,、um, uh, mm. with an English background. And、uh, despite that fact, you graduated as valedictorian. So can you tell us a bit about sort of the challenges you had、uh, joining Alba and how、mm. you overcame those challenges? So actually,、uh, the reason why I entered、uh, JIS was because. <laughs> my parents made me take all these like exams, Juken, for middle school in Japan. And I didn't pass any of the exams. <laughs> I didn't get into any school. So,、mm. and then I told my parents, like, oh, I don't want to go to, you know, like a public school where all my friends are going because all my friends knew that I was trying to get into a private school. So, I didn't want to like tell them like I didn't get into any school. <laughs> so,、um, my parents put me into、uh, international school, which was JIS. And I don't know about now, but at that time,、uh, JIS had an ESL program where you could 
uh, enter without knowing any English at all, <laughs> which was my case. Yeah. Right. So, um, like, I, I think I knew alphabet, <laughs> but that was it. So I would go to, you know, the class and then everything is taught in English, of course. And teacher would write the homework on whiteboard at the end of the class. And I didn't even know what the homework was, but I would just write it down on my notebook, like, you know, just write it down. And then I go home and uh, look it up in the dictionary, look up all the words, and then I figure out what the homework was. <laughs> That's how I started. And then, um, I don't know, slowly, well, I, I guess the motivation was kind of like, I, I failed, you know, I didn't get into, into any school. So that was kind of like my motivation. Like I started as a failure <laughs> and I wanted to succeed. So I studied really hard. I mean, like really, really hard. <laughs> and then um, after one year, I went from ESL to mainstream, you know, classes and then, yeah, graduated from there and went on to study in the U.S. So, I mean, that's quite a quick turnaround, though, from going from the ESL program to mainstream mm. to then you were in the U.S. and then obviously mm. at university and a, and a master's at Stanford. I mean, that timeline. So between the master's at Stanford uh, versus when you started, it was no more than 10 years. So you, you were saying earlier, motivation played a key role. Do you feel mm. like ALBA as an institution also provided you with like a good sort of program, like a good way to basically help you convert from that ESL program onto the mainstream program? Oh, sure. Definitely. I mean, all the resources were there. It's just up to you, like how much you want to study and work hard and, you know, um, so, of course, uh, being young kids, a lot of the students were just slacking off and <laughs> not doing anything. But I was really, I guess, determined to, to you know, to get this, this, this English thing, right? <laughs> so I studied really hard and um, teachers, of course, they helped me a lot. And yeah. That's great to hear. I'm, I'm not like sponsored by Alba or anything, but I just wanted to. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they really helped you out. And that's mm. really nice to hear about sort of motivation, too, because I feel mm. like in education, the recent movement, you know, especially the last 10, 20 years has been sort of like, it's good to support students. But there's also kind of like, everything needs to be, if a student doesn't do something, oh, how, how can we support you? You know, like, as if like, that is the problem. But as you said, sometimes the problem is just simply motivation. You're going to get students mm. who are motivated, who are going to open up their own roads, and you will get other students who you might provide them with support. But if the motivation's not there, at the end of sure. the day, I mean, it's very much your individual, you know, uh, c capacity and, you know, propensity to want to work hard. And, um, mm. you know, so you go on to an American high school, um, do you feel like your international school background prepared you for that time uh, where you joined uh, American high school? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> I mean, okay, so um, yes, I was prepared in terms of, you know, just studying as a regular student and all that. But because JIS at the time, I don't know about now, but at the time, it was mostly like Japanese kids. So uh, there were a few um, kids from uh, outside of Japan, but they were mostly Japanese. So it, of course in, in the classroom, we would speak in English and everything was taught in English, but outside of class, we would all speak in Japanese, right? Because we are Japanese. <laughs> um, so in terms of like social life, I wasn't so used to like interacting with other kids in English. So mm. that was, I guess, hard part. Um, socializing with people of different background and from, because my high school had students from like all over the world, not just, you know, Americans. So 
um, it was it was good and bad. Um, I guess I went in there with open mind and uh, made friends from different places. So mm -hmm. that's very interesting too. That you know your parents and you decided to take that Alba for three years, the USA for four years. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, there's a very popular app called Clubhouse, and through that, um, mm. I've spoken to a lot of parents about you know there's just so many options, right? Boarding school. You know, St. Mm. Mary, ASIJ. When you graduated Alba, um, I'm, what I'm curious about is, I imagine the first choice was probably to just sort of go to another INTA. But why did you guys decide to go to the USA instead of stay in Tokyo? Well, actually, <laughs> my parents weren't thinking about sending me to another INTA, international school, at all. <laughs> because... Uh, the other international schools are so expensive that mm. uh, the tuition is so expensive that they thought, well, like it's kind of like very similar to sending me abroad anyway. So mm. why stay in Japan? And, you know, like, well, they thought I, I would get better education outside. So, of course, I, I wouldn't know because <laughs> I didn't go. But yeah. Uh, it's, it's a great point that, you know, there just seems to be various ideologies and it seemed to work out for you, right? You end up um, mm. at University uh, of Washington in, in St. Louis and there you earn a degree and then you go on to Stanford. And we talked about this off air a bit. I, I didn't know this was a, a move you can do. Even though you were in the PhD program, you were able mm. to basically get a master's in political science. And then once you got your master's, you kind of had the option to just just leave. So um, we had a guest previously uh, called uh, Yoshi who did something similar, although he stayed in his PhD a bit longer. Do you, looking back, feel like that was the right choice to stop with a master's and not pursue that PhD? I think so, <laughs> because I saw so many people staying there for so long, like four years, five years. It takes about uh, six years to complete PhD. And some people, they take even longer, like 10 years. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but anyway, so, uh, but when you get to like fifth year, third year, fifth year, fourth year, like they really don't have any other choice but to stay and stick with it because they haven't worked at all in the regular companies. They don't have any practical skills. So they have to, you know, stay there and finish their PhD and hope that they get a position at another university or at a think tank, like a research institution, something like that. So I guess I didn't want to be in the situation where I don't have any choice, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted, I, I guess I started to feel very worried that I don't know anything about this world. <laughs> like I was studying politics and you know, science of politics and doing research on, you know, why, why countries go to war, why do, um, you know, certain, you know, economies work in different ways other than, you know, this ways, whatever. And then I was like, but I've never worked in the real world and I don't know anything about real world and I'm trying to do research, you know? So I was like, I should get some experience outside of this academia because academia is such a what can i say like it's a very unique community it's mm -hmm. kind of different from real world yeah, <laughs> so yeah. i wanted to go out and um and uh work and then if i felt like i really wanted to complete my phd program then i can always come back you know so I decided to leave at the point where I got my master's. And then, yeah, that's how I got here. And I, I never went back to complete my PhD. But who knows? Maybe I will when I get old. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you have to leave with a master's from Stanford, which is definitely something. Mm -hmm. I think most people would be quite satisfied with in regards to their educational uh, journey. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. you... you Turn uh, to Japan, right? You work, you work in various MA related uh, companies as well as, uh, I guess, projects. And um, right. at a certain point, you meet your now husband and mm -hmm. you guys travel to India. So during your time mm -hmm. there, 
there's sort of this pivotal moment, right, where you mm-hmm. meet yoga. So can you tell us a bit about how you met yoga? Also, how old were you when, when you started to do yoga seriously? Uh, okay, so just to uh, clarify some things, I didn't meet yoga while I was in India, which is kind of ironic because when I was in India, when we were living in India, I went to maybe one or two yoga classes. I, I had done yoga before, uh, you know, going to yoga studio or whatever for exercise mostly, um, not for like spiritual practice or anything like that. Um, but when we were in India, I didn't really get into getting, get into yoga at all. (laughs) And then it was after I came back from India and I was sort of like wondering what I want to do with my life, you know, with my career, all that stuff. I, it was definitely around the age of like 30. I think (laughs) women have their little like you know midlife crisis moment when they're in their like approaching age of 30 i guess for men it's like when they're in their 40s right but for women it's much earlier (laughs) so we start to think about like oh like how you know how should we how should i for my career and because i guess for women we have to think about like kids you know raising family so we start thinking about these things much earlier than men but anyway so it was around that time and I decided to take a trip to Sri Lanka just to clear my mind and detox and um, do all that and at the uh, this Ayurveda resort uh, center in Sri Lanka they had yoga every morning from I think it was like 5.50 or something really early in the morning. Yeah. So I would get up every morning around like 5.30 and then just put some clothes on and go to the yoga room and do yoga practice. And in the beginning, it wasn't like I didn't really feel much. I was just like, you know, doing exercise. Mm-hmm. But after maybe a week, I started to feel that something was changing definitely inside of me. And then after that, I practiced, I kept my practice. So every morning I do my yoga practice and that has been, uh, what, like four, four years maybe now, four or five years. It's been like that. So that's how I met yoga and that's how I continue to practice yoga, I guess. Wow. Well, I mean, that's what I really love about these international, you know, alums interviews, how, you know, one second we're talking about Tokyo and then we're talking mm-hmm. about Stanford and now we're talking about you and Sri Lanka. Um, mm-hmm. yoga. And um, yoga is obviously a big part of your life. And mm. what you mentioned earlier is there's this difference between approaching yoga with this mindset as it's sort of this exercise, right? Like if you ever... Mm gym member they often say oh you know you can do this or that or you can go to yoga for an hour how is that different uh from how you would say that you approach yoga from not just a physical exercise but a spiritual way Mm. that's a really good question because i never thought yoga as um as something spiritual i just i my well before i started really getting into yoga it was just you know like exercise and maybe getting a little bit flexibility here and there but uh after i started to practice it like every morning i guess the the beginning of realization is your connection with the body because you live your day like every day without really connecting with your body like you don't really know your own self (laughs) you know um and i guess the um sort of the first eye-opening event that happened actually at the sri lankan resort was in the uh, yoga class the teacher told us to do headstand I don't know if you're familiar with headstand, but it's kind of like you go upside down Never and you're on your head. <laughs> I know what it uh, looks like. Yeah, I've never done it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I knew of headstand. I had seen it happen, 
But I never thought I would do something like that myself, you know, because what if you break your neck? Like, what, what if you fall and like die? <laughs> so I never really thought about doing it myself. But the teacher like just casually said, okay, now headstand. I was like, what? Headstand now? <laughs> but the funny thing is, it was about like a, a week after, um, uh, after I got to the resort and somehow I felt ready. Like I was like, I'm ready to do this. And then I did it. And of course it was my first time. So I, I couldn't do like, you know, like <laughs> just like headstand, but uh, with teachers support and help, I was able to get into the form, you know, at least. Um, and then at that moment, I guess the two things happened. One was I real I realized that my body has this potential to do amazing things that you never thought was possible, you know. Mm. And second thing was it's all about fear. It's all it's all in your head. You think, oh, I cannot do this. Like this is impossible. But if you overcome that fear, if you overcome that negative thought, negative mindset, then anything is possible. And mm. those two things happen. And that's how, like, I guess yoga became so important to me because yoga was something that taught me those two things. And then I kept going and, you know, along the way, you know, like doing practice, of course, there are poses that I'm wasn't able to do and now I'm able to do and also there are poses that I still can't do I don't know if I'll ever be able to do but I keep at it like I keep practicing and every day is like different discovery every day is different um, realization and different conversation with your own self so that's how um, <laughs> yoga works for me and for a, a lot of people, I think. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point you brought up about having a conversation with yourself, right? Especially, mm. especially people are busy, right? In jobs like in Tokyo, it's just people are so busy. It's like, oh, I got to do this, I got to do that. And they don't mm. even think about how, how they feel um, physically, especially with their own mm. bodies. It's definitely something I can mm. empathize as. A, I've had shoulder surgery. I've had a, two knee surgeries. So there's mm. that great, uh, I think the Japanese way of saying it is like, karada to kaiwasuru, like sort of like mm. converse with your body. And I, I often find myself kind of, not, not through yoga, but through running. I definitely do that. Right. Through jog. Like, right. Okay, how's the knee feeling? Mm. And then I realized sometimes it's not as bad as, <laughs> as maybe I mm. thought it was. <laughs> mm. the... So if funny thing, you mentioned that, you know, you feel the same way when you go running. So I don't think that through doing this, like, <laughs> you know, like weird poses uh, is the only way, you know, in terms of um, conversing with your body and discovery, what form. It doesn't have to be yoga or yoga in terms of doing poses. It could be through meditation. It could be through running. It could be through just stretching. I don't know, doing something else. Or it could be just through like cleaning, uh, which is a really big ritual in um, Buddhist tradition and uh, Hindu tradition too, I think. I feel like there's, there's all these sort of facets of that sort of all combined to healthy living. And, and the next mm. one I want to talk about is veganism. So mm. um, off air, we were talking a bit about how you didn't really see yourself in the position you are now in regards to mm. not only being a vegan, but writing a book um, about vegan recipes. So how, mm. did, um, how did this all come about? How did you first turn towards veganism? Yeah, it's interesting because I used to be the biggest meat lover. You know? <laughs> I used to get Korean barbecue every single week, you know, and I could not end a day without eating meat. <laughs> I was like that. And I never 
doubted, you know, like this behavior. I mean, I thought eating meat gives me energy and mm -hmm. I needed to eat meat to have stamina and have energy and get going, all that stuff. Um, but then after I started yoga, um, well, in yoga tradition, vegetarian vegetarianism being vegetarian is like the norm and so i was like oh maybe i'll give it a try because all these other yogis and yoginis are vegetarian so i was like okay maybe i'll do vegetarian and then i start i gradually shifted towards uh vegan vegan is so basically you don't eat meat fish uh dairy and uh, eggs, yeah. <laughs> and vegetarian, if you're vegetarian, you still eat eggs and consume dairy. So that, that's kind of like the difference. But um, for me, I just shifted very gradually. And while I started doing that, I realized that, you know what? Like it's, it's not that hard for me to not eat meat well, for me, fish was kind of difficult, uh, but and eggs were more difficult. But for me, meat was quite easy actually, which was surprising because I used to be <laughs> this like biggest meat lover ever, right? So <laughs> it surprised me myself too. But I guess with the right mindset, that I guess the mindset I had was okay. I consumed so much meat over the years that I had enough to eat for my entire life. I was done, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, I don't need to eat more meat. That's how I felt. That's the mindset I had. So I really didn't crave meat at all, actually. And I didn't even use that much, like, you know, like fake meat, alternative or uh, substitute anything like that I didn't you know go for those things I mean I had them occasionally but um, yeah we, even without them I I was just fine <laughs> but I think everyone's journey is different so I don't think that this will apply to everyone but for me like quitting meat was actually quite easy mm. with the right mindset mm really intriguing and did you feel like the health benefits that came with that mm. did you feel the changes uh you know within a few weeks or did it take a few months or was there were there any at all in regards to sort of how you felt health wise <laughs> it's really interesting because before i became vegetarian or vegan i was really healthy <laughs> I, like i never got sick i was one of those kids that never got sick <laughs> like i would get like flu maybe like once in 10 years <laughs> something oh. like that i would get fever maybe once in five years something yeah. like that so i was very very healthy actually i was worried that if i only eat vegetables i might become not healthy. <laughs> that was my concern. Um, so when I started eating only vegetables and well, not just vegetables, but you know, like having vegetarian diet, mm -hmm. I found that I didn't feel unhealthy at all. I felt really good. I felt a lot of energy actually, and I was totally fine. So <laughs> it, I, if I started from point of being really unhealthy and then you know oh I became really healthy that's a really nice story but for me it was like uh same but it's just kind of like it's difficult to say because like I said I gradually shifted right I don't know if I was truly healthy when I was eating meat and anything I wanted to eat um because I compare the charts, like health exam charts from before I became vegan and after I became vegan, and they're clearly different, like blood, um, you know, numbers and everything. They're clearly different. So things were improving inside of me, but I just didn't know because uh, before 
I became vegan or vegetarian, I guess I was still young enough and all these, you know, things weren't coming up like physically as symptoms. That's really amazing too to have someone like you who has ate meat before, who also mm. can say, oh, I was healthy, but now I'm healthier. Uh, because I feel like one of the major sort of blocks people have who aren't vegan, or I'm not vegan, uh, is that you sometimes get these people who will be like, their life was, you know, in shambles and they're so mm. unhealthy. And then they became vegan. And now, now their life is wonderful. You know, what I mean? mm. <laughs> and so people hear that and they're kind of like, okay, like, you know, that's an interesting story. But it's interesting to hear how for you, um, and I've, I've seen, you know, some of your videos, I really like your approach. That's very soft. It's very like, if you want to try to become vegan, you know, give it a mm. shot. You know, maybe you're not a mm. vegan at all, but try these vegan recipes. And um, it, it might be a slow process, but I think mm. I read somewhere, um, and this is maybe something I'd like to introduce to my school one day, is um, even if it's something as simple as like every Tuesday, you don't consume meat. Mm. Every Tuesday mm. and Wednesday, you don't consume meat, uh, maybe even no dairy. When you mm. multiply that, tens of millions of people all of a sudden yeah. you have a huge effect in regards to mm. things like carbon footprint and you know oh yes just... definitely so yeah I, I love your approach that it's not very militant which unfortunately mm. i feel like, and you you might be able to tell me more about this is i feel like in the vegan mm. community mm. unfortunately there's a lot of people you know what i mean in that camp who are just kind of like mm. you have to be vegan and if you're not vegan mm. You're mm. Not mm. Vegan. Mm. So, yeah, I, I love that approach you have. Because for me, I come from yoga tradition. You know, I started being vegan and vegetarian because of yoga. And yoga is all about kindness. Yoga is all about love. So I always have this um, mindset that only positivity brings positivity. And if you approach something with a negative mind, you will only attract negative things. So, I mean, like, I know there are a lot of um, cruel things and bad things that people do to animals. I, I'm, of course, I, I'm aware of that. And I don't agree with that and I oppose that, but I just approach it differently, you know, like if, I go into the direction of exposing th such things to people and say like, look, you know, like stop your behavior and like change your way. Then people will only like feel resistant. You know, mm -hmm. you, you don't want to change like that. Well, some people might, I mean, you know, some people might think it's such an eye-opening event that they change the next day. It could happen. But for me, the approach is very different. Like I want to, I want people to basically think for themselves, decide for themselves. And there are so many people who just don't know, <laughs> you know, they just don't know what they're eating. They just don't know like what they're doing. So for me, I just want them to know that there are so many different ways that you can look at life, uh, so many different ways that you can think about food and health. And, and after knowing all the facts and after knowing all this information, and if you still choose to, you know, eat meat here and there, fish eat, here and there or like have eggs it's your choice you know it's your life and you have all the right to decide what you want to do with yourself and with your family you know but i just want people to have the courage to <laughs> to really think and know everything <laughs> that's just uh, how i feel and another point you uh, sort of touch upon in your YouTube is mm. this idea of skincare. And mm. uh, it's kind of interesting because we just had, um, I, this hasn't been uploaded yet, but a guest who uh, is a CEO of a skincare uh, routine oh, okay. play. But I know you're sort of on the opposite end in the sense that mm. you 
done, um, I think the Japanese word was something hada, was it hada dan, danshiki? Hada danjiki.、Mm-hmm. Hada danjiki, where you, know, you weren't applying any、um, mm. products on. So, can you tell us a bit about that? Because I know my wife, I was just talking to her about this yesterday, and、mm. she was telling me she's heard of this,、uh, but she's kind of、mm. scared to, to even try because <laughs> <laughs> she has a routine.、So. Yeah, what,、mm. what is the deal with the Hada Danjiki? And、um, mm. is, should people give it a try? And, and what was your、uh, experience like?、Uh, Hada Danjiki is basically where you don't apply anything on your face and no makeup, no soap, no lotion, no serum, no like sunscreen. Well, I mean, you can put some sunscreen on actually, but、um, you don't. Do anything to your face basically. <laughs> so,、uh, the idea is well, I suffered with acne for a long time, a long, long time since when I was a teenager up to four years ago when I started Hadadanjiki.、Mm-hmm. I had acne all over my face all the time, like every, like every day of the year. <laughs>、um, But then I started to realize that my face, the, the best time, best con- skin condition was in the morning when you know, my skin had time to rest without anything on my face, without any makeup, all that stuff.、Mm. And then、um, I read this book、uh, about Hada Danjiki and saying, Basically, like you apply makeup on your face, right? And then to remove the makeup, you have to use all these products to remove the makeup, which is very actually、um, abusive to your skin because it destroys the like a lot of layers on your skin and all that stuff. And then you put something, lotion. Serum, things like that on your face, which you think is doing good for your skin, but it, <laughs> it actually is not. Because <laughs> think about it, you're just applying all these like chemicals on your face 24 7. Like,、yeah. it can't be good. It cannot be good. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you think, oh, I'm giving nutrients on my face, you know, for my skin. But these nutrients will basically like you have so much bacteria on your skin, right?、Um, and all over your body. And the balance is very important. And acne is just one type of、um, ba- bacteria that's living on your face. And if it just grows too much, then you get all sorts of problems. But you want the healthy, like good kind of bacteria to thrive so that,、um, you know, all these like bad things, bad bacteria doesn't overgrow. But if you keep applying chemicals to your face, to your skin, then it kills everything. Like it kills all the good bacteria too. So it messes up the balance of your skin. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, so, it's not just your face, but if you take antibiotics all the time, it messes up the microbiome in your gut, you know, and then it leads to like all these allergies and autoimmune di- diseases, things like that. So, I guess <laughs> I'm going everywhere, but、uh, in terms of like skincare, it's not just for your skin, but for your health. I believe that less is better. Less chemical, the better. So that's how I approach health. That's really intriguing how you connected it to antibiotics. So that's actually what I was thinking in my head that there's definitely that sort of similarity where, especially like our generation, I feel like was sort of that first generation, at least in Japan, where it was just everything was antibiotics.、Mm. Right? You, you get a cold,、mm. antibiotics,、mm. you know. Like,、yeah. you got something antibiotics, and you just had this generation、mm. of kids who were taking、oh, yeah. sometimes, you know, five to ten、mm. weeks of antibiotics a, a year, which、mm. you said actually taking away their natural ability to、mm. fight off. Which I feel like a lot more people, because of coronavirus, are a bit more knowledgeable now of like, oh, this is,、mm. you know, 
body can fight it off or the body can't fight it off and how vaccines work, right? I had no idea uh, up until, mm. you know, 34 right now. I had no idea till age 34 how vaccines work. I just got them. I just went, I was like, most people, mm. they just shot it. And I was like, oh, I'm not going to get sick. But it was very interesting when I actually looked at the background of how, how it works. Essentially, it's almost making me sick on purpose uh, so mm. that I can fight, my body can fight it uh, later on. So. Right. Yeah. So when you get fever and when you get cough and you get the symptoms, you want to relieve the symptoms, which is natural, but by taking antibiotics, uh, you're not treating the symptoms, right? You're just trying to kill the bacteria that's causing the symptoms. But by doing that, you kill all the other bacteria that's living inside of you and helping you, helping you get better. So um, I guess if the symptoms are not too bad, like if they're bearable, then you bear with it. Like you just sleep in for like, you know, three, four days and get better. I think people are too busy. People are too preoccupied with what they have to do. Like, oh, I have to go to school. I have to study. I have to, you know, go to work. Uh, I have to raise kids, all these things. And they don't take the time to rest. Like, mm. it's okay if you have fever, you just stay in the bed for a few days. What is the big deal? Like, <laughs> you don't have to go to the office every single day. <laughs> You're sick. <laughs> you, you just rest up. Um, it's the way of like coming back to more like natural ways that I think people find their ultimate health that's the only way like if you go for just like fixing with more and more chemicals you you will not get healthy in the long run that's that's what i think intriguing and i want to sort of shift over now to um fasting um i think Mm. now (laughs) intermittent fasting right is quite common Mm. I, uh, i tried it myself a bit and i've talked to people it seems like a lot of people have sort of tried it out You've gone mm. a little bit the next level. You've done something, the 24-hour fasting. Um, mm. And there's actually a video on YouTube. Um, if I put in the little link to where you do 24-hour fasting for five days uh, yep. and then intermittent fasting for, I think, three days. Uh, so can you tell us about fasting in general and mm. um, your experience as well as how would the average person, you know, who's never done fasting, how can they sort of get what would be like a nice first step? Because obviously 24 hours mm. <laughs> for someone who's never done it, <laughs> it's a terrible idea, yeah, it right? Might be hard. <laughs> yeah. So what yeah. would be it that way someone get involved? Okay, so basically why why do you need to do fasting or what why is fasting good for you? So when you think about uh your everyday behavior, you wake up and you have breakfast and then you have lunch. And then you have dinner and then you go to bed and next day you do the same thing again. But uh, that means you like it actually takes a lot of energy uh, for your body to digest food. So when you eat food depends on it also depends on what kind of food you eat. But if you are not if you're like regular person eating like meat and fish and animal you know protein all the time it takes like six hours for animal protein to be fully digested so but when you think about your eating behavior you have breakfast you have like bacon and egg scrambled eggs for breakfast and then before that gets fully digested you eat <laughs> more meat for lunch, you know, eat, you eat more things for lunch. And then you're putting so much strain on your body, so much strain on your gut mm. by doing that, you know. It's, it's really simple when you think about it that way. You're running a little factory in your gut, you know, you have like fac- like workers like doing all this work for you you know making fuel for your body from the input that you put in which is food but then um they're working really hard right working really hard okay i made fuel for you and then you're like okay great here's more load for you 
bang, bang, bang. You know, you're doing that like all the time because it's not just three meals, but a lot of people they snack during the day. Like, oh, I had my lunch, but I'm just a little hungry. I'll just have my cake. You know, I'll my I have my energy bar. You know, like、mm. you're eating all the time. You're eating constantly throughout the day. So. Fasting is just giving a much-needed break to your body, for your body,、uh, to your gut. So、um, it's、uh, the longer the better, of course. You know, the time that you're、um, not putting anything into your system, so they have they really have the time to fully digest everything, and、uh, so you your body can absorb the nutrients and. You know, put the waste out of the system. That's also important, right? Yeah.、Um, but、uh, longer the better. But if you're new to this and you just want to try it out, then、uh, the best thing to start is not having any breakfast.、Mm. That's yeah, a that、so, seems like an easy way to get into it. No mm, breakfast. Mm. <laughs> and because. Uh, there are like moments when you feel hungry, but it's just it's just kind of like feeling of hunger, you know. And you will realize that okay, in the morning, right about the time when usually you eat breakfast, you feel hungry. So what do you do? You eat breakfast. But if you don't eat breakfast, yeah, you get you feel hungry. But if you don't eat, It will go away. You you won't be like hungry until lunchtime.、Mm. So you just drink some tea, or if you're a coffee drinker, you drink coffee, or just you know、uh, you drink water, and then it will pass. Like just just give it some time, and it will pass. Then you eat, you eat lunch, and that's that's it. Yeah. Okay, so then you have lunch, and then you have dinner. Let's say lunch is at twelve. And then、mm. dinner at you know seven o'clock, so、mm. not ke- not eating from seven p.m.、Uh, to、mm. noon, so that would、mm-hmm. be a seventeen hour fast. Yeah, yeah. So the goal is to、uh, have like at least sixteen hours. Yeah, if you can finish your dinner by eight o'clock at night, and you have lunch around noon, then that's fine. You know, you don't have any breakfast and. But if that's also really hard, like you're so used to having big breakfast, you know, like feast breakfast every single day, then、yeah. for you, like it's really hard to not have anything to eat in the morning. Then start with like smoothie. Start with something that's really easy to to、mm. just go go through. You know what I mean? Not like solid food and avoid animal protein, like. Have、mm. only vegetables, or you can have salad, but chew very well.、Mm. And then once you get used to that, then have no breakfast. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> that, that would be sort of the most beginner entry way.、It、would not、mm. just be no breakfast, but would be maybe something very small in the morning,、mm. like a smoothie, and then、mm. eat and eat dinner. And as you、mm. said, I think. That is a realistic way, and I definitely even just within、mm. my community, there's definitely a lot of people that、um, that do that. They eat lunch, they eat dinner, and、mm. then,、um, as you said, I think some of them have a little bit for breakfast. But again, it's usually、mm. very. The reason why, like, I want people to try fasting, saying doesn't mean like you don't eat anything for like five days, but you know, just like a small fasting like that, like not having breakfast, is like I want people. The, well, fasting makes you realize so many things. Like, oh, I get hungry, but actually, this hunger is kind of fake, you know, <laughs> because my body doesn't need more food right now. But it's just, the, it's your brain telling you, like, oh, it's time to eat, it's time to eat. But it's not like you actually need to eat. So you you start to think about like, what is really necessary? What is really essential? For your、mm. life, like, do I really need to eat this much? So once you start eating, you feel like, oh, like I'm, 
I'm hung like I'm not hungry anymore. I'm full, but you keep eating because you have a plate full of food, so you just keep eating, right? Mm-hmm. But it's it's like you it makes you realize like what is really needed. Kind of like a different theme that I have uh, in my life and on my channel, which is like minimalism. Uh, mm-hmm. So you. Think about what's essential for your life, not go over that line. <laughs> I guess to stay healthy and to stay happy. Yeah, I feel like it bring this back to sort of that conversation with yourself, right?、Mm. Something that's most hungry.、Mm. Um, I mean, obviously, you don't want to be like, "Oh, I'm so hungry," and you know, like、mm. I'm miserable、mm, at the same mm, time. Mm. It it does seem like、uh, once you get used to sort of understanding how your body、mm. operates, sort of a not antiquated.、Um, But it's just maybe against what our bodies really need.、Mm, exactly, because sometimes <laughs> your brain can tell you all these things. For, like for example, with sugar or alcohol or、um, with、uh, caffeine, you know, your brain is telling you like, oh, like you need more of this, more of this, more of this, or fat, you know. But actually,、uh, <laughs> if you Keep taking like too much sugar, then of course you know it will lead you to a really bad place. <laughs> so, in a way, sometimes you need to doubt your mind. Like you need to step back and think: Is it really like、uh, my body that needs it, or just my brain is telling me to do this?、Mm, that's a great point. That that is that sort of a. Disconnect almost between the、mm. brain and the body that you need to realize, and it connects back to what、mm. you were saying with yoga and stuff too. Where、mm-hmm. it's so difficult sometimes, though, for for、mm-hmm. people. To, <laughs> it is at least、right. for me <laughs> to a、mm. certain degree. You know, you do. You have this YouTube channel now. You said I think eighty eight thousand, so a hundred thousand followers probably within the year.、Uh, it looks like that huge. Hopefully, <laughs> mark is coming up. Would you say?、Mm. Most of your followers are Japanese nationals.、Mm, I I would say so,、uh, but there are well. So I I try to put、uh, English subtitle on all my all my videos, mostly all my videos. So I do have、uh, some English speaking viewers, but because I only speak in Japanese in my videos. Most of the、uh, viewers are subscribers are Japanese, I would say. And would you say this sort of community of you know vegans? I, mean, I assume a chunk of them are vegans, maybe not, you know,、um, all of them. But would you say that this community of you know vegan and vegans in Japan is a growing phenomenon? My channel actually,、uh, most of the people who are watching my channel and who are sub- subscribing to my channel are actually not vegan at all. <laughs> It's、yeah. funny thing,、um, but、um, a lot of them are like they discover my channel through something else, maybe through yoga、uh, or through this. There's. One video that I have, which have,、uh, which has over one million views, which is、mm. on like salad, salad recipe <laughs> video.、Mm. So a lot of people come to my channel through that video, just watching salad video, and、um, so when they come, they don't even know that I'm vegan. Like this is a、mm. vegan channel. <laughs> And then they start watching different videos, different,、um, yeah,、uh, different videos, and then they find out that oh, she's actually vegan. What is vegan? Like, like they know vegetarian, but what is vegan? <laughs> you know. And then they start doing more research, and like, oh, okay, so there is such a thing. Like, <laughs> and then you know, they become interested in in veganism. And then, actually, some of them become vegan, but not not everyone, of course. So it's it's a nice way of like getting <laughs> into to that kind of lifestyle because you come from something very different.
So your question was, is vegan uh, movement rising in Japan? And I, I think so, because just last year alone, so many new vegan places opened up in Tokyo, like vegan shops, vegan uh, cafes, you know. Mm-hmm. But I think it's because, you know, we were supposed to have Olympic Games in Tokyo <laughs> last I year. <laughs> yeah. And uh, over the years, well, years towards 2020, so many tourists, like foreign tourists were coming to Japan. Mm. So uh, there was a rising demand for vegetarian food and vegan food. And I think a lot of uh, restaurants started to think about like, oh, like maybe we need to cater these people's demand. Yeah, that's how it started. And big places like Moss Burger now have a plant-based burger and Dotor has like vegetarian burger. You know, all these places started to uh, make um, different plant-based products um big places and uh so yeah i would say uh people finding out more and more about uh plant-based options but i i would say the big change was before we used to think like you said you know like oh in the uh, vegan camp there are some scary people like extremists who are like well, hard die like animal lovers. I mean, I'm not saying like that's a bad thing. I'm just saying like there are those people. And mm-hmm. unfortunately that was creating this negative sort of like image, you know, about vegans. Mm-hmm. But now people are looking at veganism from the perspective of health and also environment, like environment has become a really big topic in Japan. And surprisingly, so many people are switching to veganism or thinking about consuming less meat or um, because of the uh, climate change, you know? Mm. So I think that has become the, that has brought this like big change to how people see veganism in Japan. I strongly agree. Yeah, I think that perspective is is definitely huge that people no longer mm-hmm. feel like. And I, I'm sure you'd agree. I feel like in the 90s, to a certain degree, 2000s, my impression as well as my personal experience was sort of like, you know, you must become a vegan, you know, or else mm-hmm. you're a bad person. Whereas now mm-hmm. it's kind of like, there's all these reasons based on science. And, you know, if you don't want to, that's okay. Mm. But, you know, here are, here are reasons to become it. You know, I'm here to, you know, talk to you more about veganism or vegetarianism. Right. I think that's definitely, mm. so that welcomingness and as you said mm. earlier, it's next with yoga and, and, you know, Buddhism, just sort of not being judgmental is definitely a way to help mm. people jump on board. Mm. So mm-hmm. you know, your, your channel continues to grow. As I mentioned earlier, probably it'll hit a hundred soon. And who knows, right, with the way channels grow nowadays, <laughs> it'll be a year or two from now. Did you find um, at a certain point that you weren't able to really talk to people as much? Because I'm sure in the earlier days, you were able to, you know, if someone comments, you were able to probably give back a comment. So how has mm-hmm. that sort of journey been from you from having, you know, a few thousand subscribers to now, you know, almost 100,000? Uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, but um, for me number is just a number right and (laughs) there's not much uh difference between having like few thousand subscribers and uh you know 80 now three thousand subscribers but um biggest i guess biggest difference is when i not not here in the mountains (laughs) but when i go to tokyo I get noticed a lot now. Like people are like, oh, you're Natsuki from Tokyo Beach Life, right? And people yeah. talk to me. So that has been a big change, I guess. But uh, also um, I started doing like offline events, online and offline events last year. 
um, connecting with my uh, viewers a lot more. So that has given me more chance to get to know people individually and talk to people and find out like why, why they are subscribing yeah. to my channel. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, what, what, what they find like interesting about my lifestyle and what they're learning. So yeah, number is just a number, but connecting with, with people in in a real way is i think more important interesting and uh this is the last question of the day um i i was originally gonna ask you you know what is your favorite dish on the book but i feel like that's too mm. i don't want i don't you know and i don't want to diminish the other 13 but so i'm, I'm gonna sort of <laughs> modify that to, um you know for someone like me who's very um mm. I, I'm, I'm not I, I don't cook basically i barely cook Hmm. I, I do a lot of takeaway, but for someone who doesn't cook that much, which one of the 14 dishes would you say is the hmm. easiest for someone hmm. to prepare? I would say from the Russian section, hmm. uh, I recommend mushroom stroganoff stew. It's hmm. kind of like cream, creamy, a little bit sour, uh, creamy mushroom stew kind of thing that you put over, like in the recipe, I put it over rice, but you can put it over like uh, cooked pasta or anything like that. And uh, it's really easy because when you think about cream, creamy sauce, like white sauce, uh, if you make with cow milk it's actually not that easy to make <laughs> you can ask your wife but it's not so easy to make but yeah. with plant-based i use cashew milk which mm. is really easy to make you just put cashew raw cashew nuts and water in high speed blender and you just blend it and you have cashew milk <laughs> it's really easy and you just combine it with mushroom and then cook on uh in a pan or pot that's it and some salt so mm. it's really easy and as you heat it it the the sauce thickens to nice consistency so you don't need to do anything you just need to you know like <laughs> so that's really easy but it's so creamy it's so rich it's so tasty that you cannot believe like this is not from cow milk it's not like the regular white uh, creamy sauce that you get so it's it's one dish um, that actually so when I was making this recipe book I had photo shoot of course and um, my editor who is Japanese and she's not vegan she came from Tokyo and uh, she tasted all the food I made yep. and this was her fa most favorite dish so okay yeah. so I just to add on a bit with the the you know the milk I know nowadays I guess in Japanese it'd be tonyu right the, any mm. kind of, sort of um, um, mm. nut-based milk uh, mm. for those mm. who are especially not mm. cooking like myself you can also mm. just buy those right that's actually what I do I drink that you know the the most common one with the sort of blue label on it, it has like the, the almond milk. Yeah, mm, so mm, mm. almond milk. Yeah, 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 yeah. For me, that's been easier because I don't even have a blender. So for someone like mm. me, without a blender, <laughs> they are available, sure. right? <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Yeah, yeah. You can you can make with uh, soy milk, almond milk. Except I think cashew milk thickens a lot better. So um, it's much easier to work with. So um, I actually recommend getting a blender <laughs> because if you have a blender, you can make smoothies too. <laughs> Who doesn't That's like smoothies? <laughs> That's a really good point. And smoothies too, I feel like you have a whole whole episode just on smoothies, right? <laughs> a whole mm. smoothie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, on that note, I like to finish the podcast with asking the guest, mm what is to come in their lives in the next few years, next few decades. So if you can tell us well, what is to come, uh, I would appreciate it. What is to come? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, well, so I want to keep growing my channel to reach more people. Um, 
And uh, to this point, I was mostly doing, um, you know, YouTube and offline, online events. But I want to start thinking about doing more business stuff <laughs> to spread the word of veganism and um, letting people experience this wonderful world of veganism and and yoga also mm. so i'm yeah <laughs> yeah you were mentioning some business ideas offline but i mean obviously we'll mm. keep that as a secret for now i don't mm. even know myself <laughs> but i guess the rest of us will will we'll all know probably in the coming coming months coming years your various business ventures that you are mm. um, hoping to get involved in and um yeah congratulations in a new place right you moved out to nagano and, Thank you. Uh, hopefully that uh, is going to be a very different lifestyle from living in Tokyo, mm. but it's be mm. far more conducive to, you know, sort of minimalist and uh, living a very healthy yoga vegan life. Great having you on today. Um, we'll definitely connect your, your YouTube channel and the little, uh, you know, thing in the bottom here. And um, Thank you. that note, uh, that was the last episode of season six, um, episode 60. Uh, that was with Natsuki. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you so much.